Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank you for taking time to come out to uh, one of our workshops of the Who Cares Why Bother Real Writing for Real People event. As one of the people involved in putting this together, I really uh, would like to welcome our two guests for this workshop, Arnie and Debbie Johnston, who are uh, playwrights of some note. Um, there's probably enough to talk about with them that would fill the entire uh, time we have allotted, so I'd just like to share uh, three things about them. On a personal level, uh, one of those is that some time ago they took the title of full-time writers. And for those of you that have seen these events before, it's very hard to find writers that actually are dedicated full-time to this work. So they live this, they earn their income from it, and are dedicated uh, to this craft of playwriting. The second thing is also they are sort of masters and they have a successful record to back it up on the art of collaboration, which is uh, something I think all writers, regardless of whether it's creative writing or even business writing, will have to deal with at some point. How do you work with another writer and uh, preserve the voice of, of both writers? And lastly, on a personal level, as a former student of Arnie and Debbie Johnston, it was in a workshop just like this some time ago where I had an idea for a play that they were able to take and uh, after working with them, it, it mounted into my first uh, produced one act play of some note. So their craft does work and I think their suggestions are, are very helpful. So on that note, I will pass it over to them and enjoy. Hello, hello. How's some ever? Well, presumably we could stay there and keep you know, carrying our mics. Down, huh? Then we'd have to sit. All right, we'll stand. We'll stand up. Um, we have some handouts today, but we're not going to hand them out because we know what happens when you do that. We talk, you read the handouts. But we will have some um, suggestions on getting started and on format. And we are going to begin today by reading a, one of our favorite forms. It's, it has a lot of uses. We're going to read you one of our 10 we're minute. Read you an entire play. Right. We'll be done probably by the time. We're going to read a 10 minute one act. The nice thing about the format, which you will be receiving today, it's not like it is in the little books that you buy plays in, is that it's a minute a page. So we know that this play takes 10 minutes. This play was a semi-finalist in the Louisville 10-minute one-act competition, and it was published in the Rockford Review. And uh, it's also... I don't know, think you have juice. Is that is it? working? Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, it's also the first play we wrote together, and I'm happy to say she writes all the hard parts. Isn't that sweet? Uh, <laughs> uh, the play is called Eclipse, and there's no real need for uh, much of a preamble, except that you know an eclipse only takes a certain amount of time, and it's over. And that's one of the things you find yourself looking for with uh, short plays, or any plays for any that matter, play, right? but especially short ones. Having a time limit built in is really useful because it means you've got to get this thing done by the time either the eclipse starts or the eclipse is over. So we keep looking for various situations that have built-in time limits. Right. Anyway. Here we go. Eclipse. The characters uh, are uh, Larry, a technical writer uh, for a pharmaceutical uh, company, and uh, Louise, uh, who is an industrial journalist for the same pharmaceutical company. Uh, the setting is Larry's apartment in a medium-sized Michigan city. Time is late summer evening, the present. Eclipse. As the lights rise, we see down center the balcony of Larry's second floor apartment. The balcony accommodates two lawn chairs and a small table. Part of the building's roof is visible above the balcony and several leafy branches hang before it. Upstage, through a sliding glass door and screen, we can see part of the apartment. 
brightly lit living room. From there, we hear the Detroit Tigers television broadcast. And we have a note here, and this is important, and we'll talk about this too. Depending on the space and budget, of course, the set may be designed minimally. <coughs> Excuse me. Louise is seated on one of the lawn chairs with her feet up on the balcony's railing. Although she's in her work clothes, she's taken off her heels and pulled out her blouse. Immediately, Larry appears in the doorway with a bottle of wine in one hand and a corkscrew in the other. He has loosened his tie and left his coat inside. God, the Tigers are losing again. I think the fork ball's an idea whose time has come and gone. Shall I open a bottle of wine? Who is that on the phone? Winnie Simons. She's in a panic because data analysis reads her statistics differently than she does. Wine? She swings her feet off the railing. Why didn't you bring it home with you? Why didn't you say something? He puts the glasses on the table and starts opening the wine. Who would have thought I'd have to say anything at all? How often is there a total eclipse of the moon? It slipped my mind. I had to take care of Winnie and her skewed statistics and the stupid chicken virus. Christ. And the new guy, Kowalski. They can do the research, thank God, but they can't make it intelligible. Thank God for that, too, come to think of it. He pulls the cork expertly from the bottle and pours two glasses of wine. Anyway, nobody needs a telescope to watch a lunar eclipse. There's nothing much to see, and they happen all the time. As bad as Greg Gordon. You'll be getting, you're getting that bad. Not as Greg Gordon. That bad. As bad. And I don't care. I wanted to look through it. They don't happen to me all the time. You could have said something at lunch. You just picked it, your pasta salad. His wife is frantic, you know, Greg Gordon's. Bryna, she always looks frantic. That red hair all wild and standing out. Well, she is. She doesn't know what to do. They've sent him away. It's all over the office. You've heard it, you must have. You hear all the gossip. I've heard. I've heard there's a shakeup doing communications here and in North Carolina too. Apparently streaming video is the coming thing. What have you heard? She thinks she may have to sell the house, Bryna. Where's you the finch feeder? What did you do with it? it? Must have blown off in the wind last night. The wind never wakes me up. It was blowing last night. And I was asleep. You were. Where is it? Down there, I expect. They look over the railing. There it is. I'll get it. Look, the birds have found it down there. He exits, and Louise puts her feet back up on the railing. You get it. That's right. You get it, Larry G. Campbell. Take care of your stupid birds. The phone rings inside. Larry? She stands, looks over the railing, and then goes inside, returning shortly with a cell phone. Hello? I know you're there. I can hear the TV in the background. Hello? Watching the Tigers today, too, huh? She takes the phone from her ear, leans forward, and calls down to Larry. Have you got it? Right here. Good. Speaks to herself, holding the cell phone at her side. You took your television to work to impress someone with something. The rings of Saturn. But it's no good here. You don't want to look too closely at an eclipse. She speaks into the phone. Still there? Hear anything useful? Whoever you are, I'm hanging up now. She closes the phone, places it on the table, and sits as Larry reappears, carrying the feeder. Why do you ask if I should open a bottle of wine when you've already decided that's what you're going to do? We've lost the hook. Here's the feeder. It's not even scratched, but I couldn't find the hook. I'm surprised. Hooks are usually hard to lose. I just thought you'd like a glass of wine. It wasn't very expensive. We can replace it. I can make a new hook from a coat hanger. They're good at fixing things. Larry leaves to get a coat hanger. And at putting things back together when they get blown apart into little bits. She calls did, to him. Did you get more thistle seed? Are we out? They'll die, you know, if we stop feeding them. They've grown dependent on us. He enters with a coat hanger and pliers. That's in the winter, I think. Throughout the following sequence, he measures, snips, and bends the coat hanger. They expect, and then they forget how to do it themselves. Only in the winter, I think. In the summer, they're okay. You know, Greg Gordon's wife really is worried about him, and that's not fair about her hair. You said you'd pick up the thistle seed. Why did you take it into the office to begin with? I told you to show Marion Ross and her friend Saturn. She didn't believe you could see the rings. Sometimes you can't see them, of course, but they're still there. While I was in Greensboro. 
on the roof of research. It's far enough out in the country so the city lights don't interfere. And high up. That too. Marion Ross's friend collects guns, says he builds them. He kept talking about how he builds guns. You build model ships or houses or bank accounts. So why didn't you bring it home? After you proved to Marion Ross and her building friends in the roof of research that Saturn has rings. That you can see the rings. I can see the rings. You never take them off, will you? Looking at her steadily, Larry lays the hanger and pliers on the table, then removes the wedding band and another ring from the third finger of his left hand, pocketing them. That proves nothing. It proves you can't see them. They're still there. He resumes working in silence for a bit while she stares at him. Then she pours herself more wine and gestures at his nearly filled glass. You're falling behind. He's playing with the coat hanger. I'm not interested in Marion Ross, you know. He finishes hooking the bent piece of coat hanger into the holes in the finch feeder. He, ha he holds it up, testing it, partly displaying his handiwork. There. But she's interested. Despite her gunsmith, Marion, Winnie and her statistics, they all are. He stands back. He stands abruptly with the feeder. I'll hang this up. As he hangs the feeder on a branch, Louise finishes her wine and refills her glass. He notices. I'm always behind. It's your bad luck. Larry, noticing the phone on the table. Did you make a call? It's yours, your silent, secret admirer again. She shares your interest in baseball. I could hear the game. She? We don't know it's a she. You said she called before I moved in. You said even though you even thought it was for me for a while, remember? And now it certainly seems to happen. I'm not worried about Marion or her ilk. Ilk? Ilk. You know who I'm worried about. He gestures at the feet. Looks pretty good, huh? Very nice. As I said, you're good at putting, patching things up, fi fixing broken stuff. That's my job, isn't it? That's what I do for downing pharmaceuticals. Nothing creative. You've heard, haven't you? That your career is building? That you'll be doing more than fixing things? That I got the job. I've heard. Kowalski told me. He's only been up here two months, but I had to find out from him. Find out who's on the way up. To the top of research? To the top, I told you. So why the secrecy? Why didn't you tell me you'd applied? I told you I was interested. I didn't apply. They asked me about it, if I was interested. When do you leave? I haven't told them yes. Just like I haven't let Marion think I'm interested, or Winnie Simons, or Bryna Gregg. He looks, uh, indicates the phone. But someone knows you're interested. Someone besides me. Larry finishes his wire and pours more wine. He checks his watch. The eclipse should be starting soon. He peers up through the branches. Your wife. Apparently, you're never to be ex-wife. Your fellow member of the Detroit Tigers fan clubs. Fellow devotees of a lost cause. You're taking the job. Is that it? You are, aren't you? No lost causes for you. I don't know. Tell me something that will make it matter. The moon never really disappears, you know. It just sort of turns a pumpkin color. You always say the right thing, don't you? I never do. Then do something now. He looks at her through the branches for a bit and then turns back. This job isn't really a promotion, you know. It's a chance to start something that can lead to something better. There's no real winter in North Carolina. The finches never need you down there. They learn to expect there as well as here. You like what you're doing up here. Oh, I'm adaptable. Maybe I'll take up golf. Maybe I don't want you to go. The eclipse is starting. She rises and they both peer through the branches. Can you see? I can't see. We're too high up. Everyone's coming out and standing in the parking lot. She turns to him. Bring your wine. Let's go down there too. She hugs him lightly, then picks up her glass and exit. He picks up his own wine and starts after her. As he does so, the phone begins to ring. He looks at it, starts off, and then returns and picks it up. Yeah, I know. 
everybody sits on his fork ball. No. Really, no. I'm not interested. I don't need the telescope to watch the eclipse. Really, you keep it. I'm building a new one. He takes the phone from his ear and looks at it for a moment, then closes it and lays it on the table. He glances back through the branches and then exits. As the lights fade, we hear the tigers play by play. They are still losing. The end. We read that as a demonstration of all the stuff we're going to say, right? Um, we have hints and suggestions and things that all playwrights need to pay attention to. How many of you are playwrights? How many of you write plays? Ah, so this is a good place to start. And Marianne, of course, this, and Mike, this is a good place to start. Um, plays are dialogue back and forth. And if you hear voices in your head, then you probably are a playwright. If you go someplace and you imagine what people are saying, you probably are, could be, a playwright. Playwriting is a, a wonderful experience. Um, we'll talk about our collaboration later, but uh, collaboration, it's, it's an art of collaboration. You don't just type something and send it off. You write a play and then you share it with lots of people who present it to the world. So. One of the first things to ask, and maybe this, I, I always found that, uh, right, that's where I'm going. I always found that taking a playwriting class improves your poetry, improves your fiction. You just can't not become a better writer. So Arnie is going to uh, talk about our first point in playwriting. Well, one of the things about uh, playwriting or any kind of writing is the, the first principle is Pay attention. You, you ha if, if you, if you want to write decently, you need to pay attention to everything that's going on around you. Oh, I, sorry. <laughs> one, of the, one of the first things you have to do is learn how to use the mic. Uh, but uh, yeah, you have to pay attention uh, as, as a writer uh, to all that you hear, all that you see, all that you feel. And uh, there's a, a question that uh, in the Jewish religion, people uh, uh, are, are used to asking uh, on uh, one of their uh, feast days, and that is, uh, what makes this night different from all other nights? Uh, and that's the essential question for a playwright. When you're starting with a blank page or a blank mind, you may have a few uh, notions about how to get started. You may have a couple of characters. You may have a situation. But you do have to ask yourself, why today? What makes this day different from these uh, for these characters, uh, different from all other days? And it's because something is being set into motion that hasn't been set into motion before that's going to lead, uh, however subtly, to uh, change. And that, that involves uh, uh, creating a balance to disturb uh, at, at the beginning of a play. And in fact, the balance in a play is a lot more I mean, I'm balanced right now, standing on my two feet. But the balance at the start of a play is more like that. It's uneasy. If you see good plays or good movies, you'll note that at the beginning, there's always something lurking in the background or even in the foreground that, that sort of uh, indicates that these people are ripe for disturbance in their lives. And that, of course, is true of uh, Larry and Louise in this little play. We find out as the play goes along what some of the things are. But uh, what you do is you create that uneasy balance, and then something disturbs it. Uh, 
And of course, we already talked a little bit about creating time pressure. The time pressure in this play is they're waiting for the eclipse. And when the eclipse starts, they leave the stage and go off to watch the eclipse. We have a, we have a play um, where they're on a golf course. That was the trick, a 10 minute play, which was actually a finalist in Louisville, um, to keep people for 10 minutes in the same place on a golf course. That was the trick. We have a play called the rock and roll alphabet game. People are driving and fighting. Mm -hmm. And they're also playing the rock and roll alphabet game, which means you, you name groups A, B, C, D. Through rock groups. Rock instance. groups, right. And um, you know, by the time you come to the end of the alphabet, you'll come to the end of the play. And you also know whether or not they start over with A again has something to say about the end of the play. So you always, yeah. it's, it's good to set up a time frame for a play. Yeah, we're always looking for uh, different situations that have their own time pressure. Once we were in Chicago for somebody else's play, uh, and we went to a restaurant, and uh, we wound up, all the parking places were taken in front of the restaurant, and we had to park blocks away, almost as far back as we'd, we'd come from. And it was a lousy neighborhood with broken glass all over the place. And, and the guy who was driving was not happy to be parked there. And when we got back to the restaurant, there was a parking place right in front of the restaurant. And he made us stand in the parking place <laughs> till he went back to get the car. And Debbie and I were standing there, looked at each other and said, 10 minute play. Because, <laughs> you know, for one thing, how long can you stand and keep a parking place in a city like Chicago? Not very long. So we got 10 minutes out of that. And it, up, it ups the uh, pressure. Yeah. It certainly does. They come on sort of arguing and not happy about the parking place. But the tension between them, which is, of course, has to be more important than that, builds as they go on. And that takes you to what characters want. Right. In a play, are, are you fiction writers? How many of you write fiction? <laughs> Poetry, are there poets out there? Ah, two hands for the poet, right? Um, in a play, and, and I think in a sense this applies to fiction too, uh, each character needs to want something. They have to have a reason. Even the person selling the candy at the counter can have something very little, but they need to be a real person with real wants. Um, an excellent example of this is No Country for Old Men. There's a, this reminded me, there's a, a man at the counter. Have you seen No Country for Old Men? The man at the counter and the crazy guy, killer. the killer comes in and wa wants, to, um, wants him to f call a coin flip. Yep. And the guy at the counter, what he wants at that point is to stay alive. Um, ca all characters have goals in plays. Uh, they all have short-term and long-term wants. If it's a long play, in each scene there needs to be something, something they're working for, some goal they're working for. Uh, one of the best things you can do in a play is make a character care about someone. Have you seen Tree of Life? Sometimes movies are, nobody's seen Tree of Life. You have to go to that one, let me tell you. But Brad Pitt plays a less than perfect father. He's sort of a 50s father who believes he rules the roost. But he loves his sons, and though he is unkind to them, there are moments when his love just overpowers him. And that making, the, the fact that he loves his sons makes you care about him. Another one of my examples, and an academic rolled their eyes at me about this one, but I know I'm right, um, is in Macbeth. Macbeth is a pretty ghastly character, pretty pretty bad, but he loves his wife. There is that's his redeeming quality, really, is that he loves his wife, and so uh, there are other things because Shakespeare is a master, but you can keep him in your heart and follow him. Arnie just recently played King Lear at Kalamazoo Civic, and when we first started running lines, I found it very hard to be sympathetic to Lear. He gets himself in his own trouble. But as you read it more and more, you realize that he loves his daughter. He loves his friends. They love him. I mean, why would you follow this crazy man around the countryside and put your life in danger, as Gloucester obviously does, and the others are. 
and that makes you care more about the character. So you must make characters care about someone and give, here's, here's another thing. You know, I think this is good in fiction. It's helped my fiction. Give each character an occupation. It colors everything they do, an occupation or a preoccupation. But if somebody works for a pharmaceutical company, that an originally and initially and completely helps you figure out who they are. We're teaching a playwriting class now where one of our students made a two-page, single-space description of his characters and figured out these things. And, you know, in a short story, why not give, it depends on the short story, but why not give them a profession? So those are suggestions for playwrights. Another thing is to focus on the physical. Use objects, actions in the play we were just we just read they have a telescope they have a cell phone or they don't have a telescope or they don't have a telescope right there is a telescope that they don't have and it's very important and you know, as please fly by you at the end he obviously didn't leave his telescope at work he's got the ring stuck in his pocket and the telescope is at his never to be ex-wife's house although he's left I mean, then those things take on a real significance. If you're stuck in a story, look and see what kind of world these people live in. Look and see what kinds of things you can add. Another thing is to get the details right. Uh, we have a play called Zamboni Situation, which was done in Carmel. We got to go to Carmel. That's a nice thing about being a playwright, too. You get to go and see them done. And they did a beautiful job. They had, it has Michigan State Troopers in, and they got Michigan State Trooper uniforms and patches, which they had to sign something to take care of because we honor Michigan State Troopers and all of this, this is very important. And they talked about the free press, the Detroit free press, which it isn't, right? I, you know, if you're not free from, press. it's the free press. Or the freep. We, if we'd said freep, yeah, they might have gotten it right. But yeah. it's not the free press. Get the details right. Now, that's the actors who need to get them right. But you need to get them right, too. Can you think of another example where? Well, the, the, the fact is, if, if you look at just that little play we, we read, Eclipse, uh, if, you, if you simply made a list of all the stuff in it, r it, it either that appear on stage uh, or uh, are talked about, uh, You've got quite a list. There's the wedding ring, engagement ring, cell phone, the telescope, the bird feeder, coat hanger, bottle of wine. All of those things seem sort of trivial in a way, but that's what our lives are made up of. That's what we uh, interact with during the course of a day. And, uh, you know, when people write plays, they often think, boy, I've got to be writing about something really important here, you know, big ideas and so forth. Well, big ideas always start with little stuff, or they uh, come out of uh, use of and discussion of little stuff. And right. that's, uh, that's what's exciting uh, about the process. And then, and, and I find this very true in writing short stories, when you come to the end, and endings are the hardest part, they're where movies fall apart, we all know that. They disintegrate into car chases because somebody hasn't taken the time to be a real writer at the end. But when you come to the end of anything you're writing, you can, and you're not sure how to end it, you can go back and look at the stuff you've put in it. The, I always like to use sliced salami, but you know, the wine, the cell phone, the bird feeder, the telescope, and see how that will guide you towards an ending. And that's, that's true, I think, in fiction, as well as playwriting. You know how you get angry? Uh, uh, you may be angry at your partner, your friend, but what it comes out as is you're being really frustrated at whatever little task you're you're trying to do. You get really angry about that, and it's displacing the anger that you really want to express to someone uh, who's, who's close to you. And th on stage, it's, it's really uh, important to have that kind, of, that kind of focus. One of the things we did in this play a lot is something called crosstalk. If you're a fiction writer, 
and you think about playwriting your dialogue as a fiction writer will never have hi how are you I am fine in it ever um, in this this is something you can use in fiction too. crosstalk is if I say to you what do you want for lunch and you say I don't know what to tell my father I've got salami and tuna Sometimes he makes me so angry. Sometimes people talk at cross purposes. Um, sometimes if it's their issue or another person's issue. But that's certainly something you can use in fiction. And of course poetry that has dialogue in it. Um, and it's important, speaking of dialogue, it's important that, that uh, dialogue sound like regular people talking. But it's also important that it's not regular people talking. Because all you have to do is eavesdrop if you're at a, a restaurant and you listen to somebody in the next booth, that's talk. <laughs> and you're not going to get people to pay admission for talk because it's right. never very interesting and it's full of fits and starts. So dialogue is talk or it, it's, it's masquerading as talk, but it's uh, trying to create action and character and complication and, and so forth. One of the things we say to beginning playwrights, and I did this when my main work was fiction, is you need to listen. You need to eavesdrop. You need to snoop. Listen to your roommates on the phone and write it down. You yeah, will never be do, able. People do say good things. Right. They say wonderful things, and you'll never be able to invent it, and you won't remember it either. Um, we, we have a play called Froth with complications, because we actually heard somebody say something was froth with complications. Instead ins of fraught. Instead of fraught. And, and, so and, and, and just to, to illustrate, you know, Debbie said, you don't, you don't have people saying, hi, how are you? That's wasted space on, s on stage. You know, somebody answers the phone, and you have them say, hello. Well, yeah, people do say that, but I think of uh, one of my friends uh, who used to teach uh, down at uh, WMU who called, <laughs> who called his sister, and he told me about this later. He dialed the number, and his sister came on the line, and he said, how are you doing? And she said to him, why breathe? <laughs> uh, and if you, know, if you hear that on the other end of a conversation, you know you're not in the land of hi, how are you? We were at uh, an air, uh, one of our friends was at an airport once and was sitting in the waiting area and <laughs> he actually heard, uh, we used this in a play, we're shameless about stealing stuff. He, he actually heard this intense conversation between a, a guy and a, and a girl or a man and a woman and the, the man said, if you leave me, it was in San Francisco, if you leave me, I'm going to drive the car out to the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge and jump. And there was a beat. And then she said, if I leave you, I'm taking the car. <laughs> <laughs> you got to use that somewhere. That's right. And we did. You're next, my dear. And, and uh, you know, that gets us in, into dialogue. You know, on the hi, how are you uh, thing, you don't just have people ask, you know, or, or, or comment on something and say, geez, it's hot today, and then they go on to something else. If somebody says on stage, geez, it's hot today, chances are somebody else will say, you think this is hot? You should have been here two years ago when what happens when you pick subjects on stage well, some of you are, you're, you're all in a, a comp class right now, most of you, uh, and you know all about the old paragraph, topic sentence, develop the topic, come to a, a, a conclusion or a transition. That's exactly what you do on stage, only the paragraphs on stage are different pieces of dialogue. So when somebody says something, you don't just let it go, you develop it for a little while and then go on to a conclusion or a transition because you don't want to waste the opportunity to develop character, to introduce something that can uh, forward uh, the action and, and so forth. 
it, it, like a paragraph of prose, a paragraph or a sequence of dialogue should accomplish something, should move the play uh, forward. Another uh, thing that's, that's really uh, uh, useful in plays, and I hope you could see that or hear it in Eclipse, is echoes and connections. If something comes up early in a play, and this works for stories too. Uh, if something comes up early in a play, if you use it again in some maybe less expected way, uh, it, it will create a little jolt of electricity. Uh, one of the uh, uh, illustrations of, of that is if you hold. Here, I'll hold this. Thank you. If you, you, know, if you hold up a, a shoelace or something, and just let it dangle. That's what it's like if you use something in a play and don't do anything with it. If you use it again somehow, you create a connection from here to here. And that connection adds tension. And of course, if you add enough tension, you can actually make sound, you can make it sing. And that's what can happen in a play with, with your action. Am I up? You're up. All right. Don't hoard inventions. This, I think, is true in fiction as well as plays. You don't want the audience to say, oh, I know it's going to happen. And if you can't help it, don't save it to the end. Use it up now, and then you have to think up something new to happen. How many times on television shows do you know exactly what's going to happen? Um, but if you think of really good movies, and I think that's more of a common ground we have since you're not playwrights, really good movies, you don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, have you seen The Hangover? Oh, you guys need to go to movies. You need to, find, you need to find a cheap theater and go to movies. The Hangover is a comedy that's extremely well done because you don't know what's going to happen next. And that, you know, on, on all levels, on, in great art, or in great entertainment, don't hoard your inventions. Don't let somebody in the middle of your short story be able to figure out how it's going to end. And if you're building to that, use it now. Then you've got to find something new to build to that's more than that, that builds on that. So that's, that's a real concrete advice, piece of advice we have. Why don't we wrap up pretty quick here, and then we can oh, read wrap something up. else and... We'll read something else. Take some questions. T take some questions. Talk about collaborating maybe a little. No. Provide opportunities for laughter. If you don't provide them, they'll laugh in the wrong places. Arnie just did Lear, and it's amazing how many places there are in that serious, serious play for you to laugh. For example, when Lear becomes, as Arnie referred to him, a nutball, uh, he does some things that are funny, and Arnie, when he runs off the stage, he says, if you get it, then you'll get it with running when Cordelia's men have come to save him, and he doesn't know who they are, and Arnie ran up off the stage. It was quite funny. People laughed every night. Uh, if you don't do that, shall I tell him my story or not? Do I have time? No, we don't have time. <laughs> we do, we do. We've got 20 minutes. Yeah, Okay. I'll tell it quickly, how's that? One of my first plays I had done, um, and my, my sons were maybe your age and a little younger, and uh, we- The story takes forever. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm from him, he's saying this. We went to see it. I took a bunch of kids with me that were between 16 and 20, and I'm not saying that that's juvenile, but uh, it was a one act, and there was one before it that was very serious. It was about somebody who'd been involved in Hiroshima and had, killed people and was now consumed with guilt. It was a very serious play. This person was consumed with guilt, had killed their cat, buried it in the garden. It was a beautiful set. They had a garden with dirt all inside of like flower boxes. Am I going too long? Am I telling too much? So um, at the end of the play, he's going to dig up the dead cat, and there I am sitting with all these boys, and he's yelling, pussy, 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 and he's digging away, pussy, 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 and of course, 16-year-old boys. I defy you to yell pussy, pussy, pussy multiple times among 
teenagers and not get some kind of reaction. Well, not get a reaction from grown-ups. And I went backstage because my play was second, and the playwright was there. Who brought those children, those immature children? And I'm thinking, well, if you've given them a place to, if you didn't use that word, but if you've given them a place to laugh earlier, they might have been less inclined to giggle there. Yeah. It's also important not to have a tin ear. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Well, the, the other good example is um, the porter in Tell Macbeth. I am, I am. The porter in Macbeth, the purpose of that is because Shakespeare knows that in that play, you need some opportunities to laugh or you're gonna laugh when people get stabbed and we don't want that. All right, you're last. Remember the resources of the theater. All I'm going to say about the resources of the theater is you're lucky you have them as a playwright. The uh, lighting, set, costumes, uh, uh, the sound design, set design, and they can be as complicated and sumptuous as possible, or they can be absolutely minimal, which leads us to what we're going to read next, which is even shorter than the one we You're read saying, oh, thank goodness, right? Yeah, thank God. Uh, and it's called Scattered Shower. And it actually, as a lot of the things that happen uh, with, with our plays, it started off because we got an invitation to a shower. Baby shower. A baby shower. And, and pretty much what you hear and hear the details about the shower are not invented. <laughs> They're really nice people, but they live in Kalamazoo, so we will never read this play in Kalamazoo. No. Anyway, it's Scattered Shower. The characters are Kevin and Marigold. The setting is an automobile, which uh, for our purposes is represented by you know, a few chairs. Uh, at the time is the present. Scattered showers. As the lights rise, Kevin and Marigold, dressed for a party, are getting into the car, he on the driver's side. Before sitting next to him, she places a wrapped gift on the back seat. So, what did we get the little nipper to be? Well, Lily's invitation said Sally and Sam weren't expecting gifts. But she went on to say that if we wanted to get them something, they registered at Babies R Us and somewhere else I don't remember. They don't expect gifts, but they went to the trouble of registering at two different places. We brought a gift anyway, wouldn't we? I'd rather have the option to get it from someplace I decide on. Starts the car. Do you have the address? Uh, the invitation said they want gender neutral gifts. They don't want to know what the baby's sex is until it's born. He's driving now. So no purses or automatic weapons. Though, I suppose from a certain point of view, everything is gender neutral these days. Kevin, they only said, Kevin, they said only natural fibers in anything that would be next to their baby's skin. What, like wool? How many pages does this invitation run? Kevin. I assume it includes an address. They live on one of those Scottish name streets on the west side, you know, near 9th Street? Tartan? Don't be silly, that's a fabric. Well, at least it's a natural fiber. The streets have names like Balmoral. McTavish? I'm not talking to you anymore. Good name for a dog. But not a street. Or a nipper. Where did you pick that up? I have eclectic tastes. Sterling? That's it, Sterling Castle Drive. Do we have a house number? I'll know it when I see it. Three garages on the right, Lily's new water feature in the middle of the front yard. I thought you'd bring the number. I thought you'd take that responsibility. So, gender neutral. They want to be surprised about the baby, but not about the gifts. I wouldn't be able to wait. I'd have to know the sex. You mean you will have to know the sex. That's why so many children have yellow and purple rooms, gender neutral colors. Purple for a boy? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Kevin. The color of royalty. Or a baboon's butt. Oh, that would be scarlet, I think. Also pretty royal, I suppose. The point is, it's better to know, since you can. We can. We will. So what did we get, the little bugger? How about a monkey? With a purple butt? Or scarlet. It's not a monkey. Too bad, babies like monkeys. I like monkeys. Why do American developers think Americans want semi-mansions built on streets with Scottish names? Lily always has good food. We'll probably have sliced filet mignon and chocolate-dipped strawberries. The way to a man's heart. Though, not through his stomach. 
So what gender neutral gift did we get him, her, it? <laughs> she retrieves the gift from the back seat. It's in a gift bag with purple and yellow tissue, paper fluff fluffing out of the top. I guess the street names are supposed to make people feel like lords and ladies of the manor. Or gender neutral persons of the manor. We would have to know. Will have to know. Dr. Carbon says we've reached the point. What point? The point of procedures where things are no longer neutral. Where things are no longer easy? You have to turn here on Tombermoy. No, it's way up there at Lomond. I don't think so. Trust me. You, trust me. So w what's more serious? W what procedures? Inverness, here. <sighs> more serious. Drugs, long needles, sex on demand. Sex on demand, that's all right. This is serious. Why do I always have to buy the gift? Because you're good at it. Why sex on demand? What did Dr. Carabon say? He said, if we want this, it gets harder now. Long needles. Do we? We do. We did. Things don't have to get harder. I love you. Anyway. There's Stirling Castle Drive. So, what did we get the little nipper? Surprise me. The light snapped to black. You know, I, somebody had said something about speaking briefly about collaborating. How do we do it? Sad. Yeah, that's the, hard part. <laughs> the sad answer is it's a gift. I think there are several things that you have to be sure of. You have to be sure of your own talent. You have to have had recognition and, and feel secure. And you have to be sure of the talent of the person with whom you're writing. And if you do that, and if you're a collaborating kind of person, <laughs> if you can get along with people, if you can give up something you think is really important and only fight about the really, really, really important things and you trust the talent of the other person, collaborating works. But the problem is, all too often, people want it their way. We collaborated with a woman in Chicago and it didn't work at all because she wasn't willing to give an inch on whether you say this is a taxi or this is a cab. I mean, on the little things, and it didn't work. It wasn't a collaboration. No. Do you have something to add to that? Uh, yeah, no. Only that uh, the way we work is one of us will write some stuff and then turn it over to the other, and the other has the option of improving on whatever he or she got and going on from there. And that way, one, one of the things we were talking about earlier, Debbie was talking about earlier, is how uh, nice it is when plots surprise you, when, you know, where things you know, come up unexpectedly. Well, the nice thing about collaborating is you surprise each other. So if you're already surprising each other, you've got a better chance of surprising the audience. So it's a little like cheating uh, as, as a writer. Um, and uh, the question, I think maybe it's easier in play writing, the question of my voice. Well, when you're writing a play, you have lots of voices. All of the characters have a voice. And so, you know, if you've got a, a, a villain, we both adopt the voice of the villain. But right. Yeah, somebody asked us uh, at, at one point if, uh, you know, how, y how if you were collaborating, you could surrender your own writer's voice. And, you know, if you're collaborating on plays, the only voice or voices that matter are the voices of the characters. It's not your voice, it's their voices. And, and uh, the nice thing is, you know, when you reach that point in a story or a poem and you, you're pushing because you don't know what comes next, if you're collaborating, there's somebody to help you decide what comes next. It's, it's always exciting. And again, you've got to trust the talent of the person with whom you're working. If uh, you do have any questions about anything, uh, please feel free to uh, ask. We do have some handouts for you, so you shouldn't oh right. go away empty-handed. Oh right. uh, we've got, you know, we talked about the importance, you talk, of, I'll do of, this. Uh, the importance of format. 
uh, how a play looks on the page and how long it takes, a minute per page. We gave you a little excerpt from a longer play, and we also gave you, are going to give you what we talked about uh, earlier about getting started with writing plays. There's a single sheet. Yeah, Marianne. 